Good afternoon, I'm Shannon Derejo. Welcome to our webinar on the importance of integrating ESG into strategic and organizational risk processes, hosted on behalf of ESG Africa Conference and sponsored by S&P Global. This webinar will explore the critical role of risk management in strategy development and emphasizes the integration of environmental, social and governance or ESG considerations. Discover how effective risk management identifies and mitigates threats early while integrating ESG enhances resilience, value creation and business model transformation. Gain insights on aligning risk management with organizational strategy for sustainable growth and success. Before we start, please note that the chat and the Q&A are available to you. Please post your questions in the Q&A and your comments in the chat. Both the Q&A and the chat are at the bottom of your screen. Please be aware that we are recording this webinar and we'll send the recording to you when it's available. We are also streaming the webinar live on YouTube and we'll share the link in the chat once it's available. I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Wendy Poulton. She's the Director of Strategic Mindsets, a company specializing in strategy and risk consulting and coaching. She's also the co-founder and director of ESG Africa Conference. She has a unique set of skills that combine strategy, sustainability, risk, and coaching. Wendy will facilitate the discussion with today's panel, which consists of Baba Javed, Open Innovation Lead at Innovate UK Global Alliance Africa, Sudesh Pursad, MD of Blue Semper Consulting, David Lucas, Corporate Specialist in Environmental Management, Risk and Sustainability at ESCOM, and Patil Mesrobian, the MEA Sustainability Solutions Director at S&P Global Sustainable One. I'll hand over now to moderator Wendy Poulton to start the discussion. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you so much, Shannon, and welcome to everybody. This is a topic that really is very close to my heart. I um, It almost mirrors my career <laughs> over the years. And um, I'm really looking forward to having such an excellent panel to discuss these issues. And as Shannon said in her opening comments, we are really going to look at it from an ESG angle, but we're going to start off the discussion with how you integrate uh, risk into strategy in the organ in organizations and because in my view your ESG issues should be integrated into your bigger company strategy and not a standalone strategy so how do we make sure that ESG issues get onto the table with the strategy guys um, and I'm taking risk as being both positive and negative so how do we get ESG risks into the strategy discussion early on so that it can help transform our business models. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm going to start off by asking the panelists to comment, first of all, on what do you think we should be doing in this VUCA world that we live in with a lot of change and uncertainty to make sure that we have an agile strategy that is able to react to ESG-related risks? So I'll start with you, Baba. Hi, I'll just give a brief initial comment. So basically, to look at risk, you need to evaluate. Um, it's the evaluation of the resilience and the sustainability of your organization. So you need to kind of look at where you are now and also where you want to be in the future. And essentially, the world is changing. There's always new technology on the horizon. Audiences' needs are changing, uh, use cases are changing, um, and I work primarily in the field of innovation. So that's basically my job, to figure out what's changing and what can be done in new, better, and more effective ways. So I think it's about thinking ahead, to be conscious that everything is changing, and to also just ensure that you have adequate resources that are going to be uh, given towards innovation and uh, fresh thinking uh, and not just getting them all bogged down in business in you, as usual, which is off quite often what happens in many organizations. You're so busy just kind of doing what you do really well that you don't really have um, the kind of, uh, I guess, enthusiasm for sidelining resources into things that, you know, may or may not come to be in the future. So I would say just to, to kind of um, minimize your risk and especially any kind of critical risks, 
It's about thinking ahead and having an innovative mindset. Thank you. I think those are great comments. And as you rightly point out, it's really important to do this within an innovation framework or org mindset, as you say. Uh, Patil, your comments. I think the first step in integrating ESG is, first of all, to acknowledge that sustainability, ESG, climate change is a new source of risk, and it is quickly being evolved into a prominent financial threat. And this is not a distant risk. It is going to have significant implications, financial implications, if it's left unaddressed by the organizations. There are so many studies, such as the IPCC, that's showing how specifically climate is having material impacts uh, on a national level, on a company level, at an asset level. And those, those risks are, are global in nature, and it's going to have, it's going to impact the different economies, the different sectors, and the different entities. So the way future generations are impacted by sustainability or climate risk depends on what are the actions that we're taking now. Uh, the first step would be for organizations is to identify what are the material ESG factors that is relevant to their sector, relevant to their internal and external stakeholders, and then based on their material ESG factors, integrate that into their strategy and into their uh, risk models. Thank you. And thank you for raising that, that a lot of the risks that we saw coming down the road at us have now arrived and risks anymore, they're realities, right? And so it's really important to take that longer term perspective when we're doing this as well. So thank you for that. Dave. Great. Thanks very much, Wendy. And I think just linking on to what's been said before is I, th I think as part of that, that need to recognize that that any of your stakeholders, especially lenders, they before they make a decision to actually engage with you invest with you have a relationship with a the company they look at what your risks are they look at how you're treating those risks and i think we know previously the financial risks and looking at your financial statements is where it was but we know that companies and especially lenders they are looking at these esg risks and when they look at what your esg risks are they also take that whole concept of double materiality. They're looking at not just those environmental, social, and governance risks that affect your financial position as a company, but they're also wanting to understand what are those ESG risks that are affecting society and affecting the environment, the outside look as well. And I think, therefore, when you look at the need of strategy, it is about how are you ensuring that your strategy is addressing these material environmental, social, and governance risks that you have, how you're treating them, how you have the governance structures around them, how you're setting the metrics in place to measure and, and perform on it. And so it is about ensuring that integration of your ESG as another one of those risks and opportunities into your whole strategy. And I think just importantly, and, and, you, and you raised as well, Wendy, that when we look at risk, it is important that we look at the opportunities. And I think ESG is one of those where you're always looking at what are the environmental, social, and governance risks? What are the opportunities? And how are you then addressing or treating your risk? But how are you pursuing those opportunities that also come out of it? And we know climate change is one of those where you, you both have a risk in terms of carbon tax, um, entry into other markets, um, vulnerability, but there are also opportunities. And so, for, for example, a company like Eskom, the opportunities come with a just energy transition. So it is good to look at both the, the risks and the, the opportunities and make your strategy agile to address that as well. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Sudesh. Sure. There's uh, little to add, but um, I'd like to echo a lot of what the other panelists have said. And I think uh, Dave hit the nail on the head there. The risk has to be incorporated, ESG risk has to be incorporated into organizational risk. And I mean, if we look at the organizational strategy process, the organizational strategy process has a number of drivers, and one of the key drivers is risk. Okay. And some of the objectives of organizational strategy. The end goal is value creation. And if we look at 
how the risks inhibit the value creation, then we can start looking at the components of the risk that contribute to inhibiting value creation and address it as such. So that's where ESG risks need to be considered as part of the collective and holistically um, with organizational risk. You know, it should not be seen as an afterthought. It should be fully integrated. It has its own set of drivers. And uh, I mean, Dave mentioned it already, materiality and double materiality. So we've got to look at the financial and non-financial factors or non-financial risks that contribute to the success of the organization. So, I mean, I fully support what my colleagues have mentioned here. It, we need to consider ESG risks from the very outset. It needs to be part of the organizational risk process. And in exactly the same way as we have a risk appetite for organizational risk, we need to start developing a risk appetite for specific ESG risks. And when I'm talking ESG risks, I'm talking uh, broadly across three pillars. We need to look at environment. We need to look at social. We need to look at governance. A lot of the times we make a mistake where we say ESG, oh, we'll, we'll talk about climate change and that's a risk we will address. But we forget about the social component and we forget about the governance component. So what I'm suggesting is that, not suggesting, what I'm proposing is that when we look at ESG and the risks, we look at it collectively within the organizational risk framework and across each of the pillars. Thank you, Sadesh. Um, I want to just ask a follow-up question to the panel because it sort of comes together with what a number of, of you have commented on. And that is the fact that it's my perception that um, risk processes 15 years ago used to be very much bottom-up driven from the organization. And although we did have some business intelligence going on and a couple of things, um, it wasn't a, and policy issues, it wasn't driven that much by external or strategic risks on the organization. And now with issues like climate change and as um, was mentioned about lenders putting this big pressure through financial mechanisms on ESG, a lot of it has moved sort of to external. And so what Sudesh is saying, I totally agree with. We now need to look at not what's your risk tolerance, but what's your risk appetite for what is seeing as risky changes as a result of ESG. Mm. Um, so how do we do that in organization to make that shift to be a lot more externally focused than internally? Anybody want to have a go at that? Yeah, I can have a go at that, Wendy. Thank you. So this, I mean, talking specifically about ESG, it's very, very complex because if we look at the drivers into ESG strategy as a contribution to overall organizational strategy, um, in my view, there are three main components that contribute to, to the strategy. The external drivers, the internal drivers, and the purpose of the organization. Okay. Now, when it comes to... Um, to the influences, the stakeholder theory plays a very, very important part in driving and defining ESG strategy. And we see now the, the, modern, uh, the modern stakeholder is much better informed, expects much more, is better connected globally as well as to the organization. So they have an influence and they have a say. And it is really tricky for organizations to identify all of those external stakeholders, prioritize them, and then take into consideration their influence into the strategy process. Very similarly, I mean, internally in large corporates, you could be a very complex organization, multi-divisional. You have multiple internal stakeholders at various levels who also have a say. So the stakeholder uh, value proposition in ESG is absolutely critical to drive the success of any ESG initiative. So how do we become more agile, given that we've got these external pressures now as well? Uh, Patil, can I perhaps ask you, what are some of the tools and practices and best practice that you see as a company that works all over the world in this area? I just want to echo Sudesh and what he said. And first of all, identifying those key drivers, both internally and externally, this is something that should be done in the materiality assessment exercise, where we look at what are the external and internal stakeholders, look at it uh, from an a, a impact perspective, risk perspective, 
uh, factors that are going to have an impact on, on, on the business continu continuity, and then identify what are the key metrics that should mm. be used to inform the strategy, and then use those metrics later on to, to, to monitor the performance, to, to monitor the effectiveness um, of, of, the, of the strategy and of the overall uh, value uh, that the strategy is, is aiming to have. In terms of the different tools and methodologies uh, that are available to support integration of uh, sustainability, climate, and to risk and strategies, uh, there are there are many. Uh, sustainability is a complex issue. It's an evolving issue, and it, it's going to be difficult to assess it and manage it without the right tools, methodologies, and guidances out there. Uh, first of all, we, we do have the climate scenario analysis. So if we're taking the climate part of the sustainability, uh, which, which is um, having material financial impact on organizations, we do have the climate scenario analysis and the forward-looking projection of the risk to assess the potential financial impact of the different climate scenarios. We do have the two degree increase in the global temperature, and then we have the more ambitious goal to limit it to 1.5 degrees at the end of the century. So we do have climate scenario analysis used to identify the most vulnerable assets, the most vulnerable uh, portfolios, and then develop strategies to mitigate those risks and identify the opportunities. Uh, scenario analysis is recommended by so many uh, frameworks. We do have the ISSB, the, DC, uh, the, the DCFD, uh, and it's an important tool for organizations to use to assess the business implications of climate risk, identify the opportunities, and then inform their stakeholders, the external ones, the internal ones, on how they're positioning themselves in terms of, uh, in light of these uh, risks and opportunities. Then we have uh, climate stress testing. Uh, climate stress testing involves subjecting the company financials to different um, scenarios, including the NGFS scenarios, which is the uh, network for greening the financial system. And here, uh, the climate scenarios are used to forecast the complete uh, company financial statements on their different uh, uh, climate scenarios. Uh, then we have physical risk assessment. So physical risk assessment includes identifying and assessing uh, the different physical risk hazards and how they're posing a financial um, risk on the company's assets uh, uh, under those forward-looking scenarios. And physical risk can include hazards, both acute and chronic, like sea level rise, coastal flooding, extreme weather temperature. And at SMP, we have done many studies and we have found that, especially in Africa, 77.6% uh, of the companies have at least one asset uh, that are uh, exposed to a high risk under the IPCC's medium high scenario by 2050. And only 23.7% uh, of the companies in Africa are conducting um, physical risk uh, scenario based analysis. So there is a lot of opportunity here to identify those opportunities and a lot of opportunity, uh, a lot of uh, areas to, to address uh, those gaps. And uh, lastly, uh, last we have the, uh, the databases such as SMP's databases uh, that covers sustainability related data, climate related data, and data is very crucial for organizations um, to integrate it into their um, financial planning, risk models, and strategies. Um, and um, last but not least, when it comes to choosing the right tool, the right framework, the right methodology, we have to make sure that companies are selecting uh, the one that is um, sector specific, the one that is um, relevant to the asset types that, that they have, that they're exposed to, they're meeting the regulatory requirements and they're also meeting the stakeholder requirements. It's, 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 it's a highly evolving um, industry, so it's, it's crucial for the organizations to stay up to date and always look for the best practices uh, to make sure that integration is happening uh, in the best way possible. Thank you, Patil. And I think that just really highlights, Nasi. I mean, I love that you brought up scenarios because I've mm -hmm. used them a lot in my career and I find them so useful because we're dealing with uncertainty. We're dealing with future facing processes. So those assumptions that we make are changing all the time. And that means dealing with that kind of data as well as all the other kind of data that you need for reporting 
um, as Dave was saying, also with materiality and double materiality and all of those things. So, Dave, I wanted to ask you as a follow on to that, Eskom has combined some of those departments together, risk, strategy, sustainability, um, planning. What was the motivation behind that and how has that helped in the management of this data? Was Eskom's a big organization? Does it help having that central coordination from an organizational design perspective? No, thanks, Wendy. And I, and I think you know, part of your question that you started off with about being agile, and I think just from the comments from the other panelists, clearly that integration is a key part. I think we, we acknowledge that you, you cannot deal with strategy and then afterwards think, well, let's apply risk methodology to our strategy. <laughs> your strategy has to be developed and, and take into account your risks and opportunities at the same time. And similarly with ESG, it's got to be around the integration of what are those material ESG issues into your strategy so that you're developing your strategy to address those material issues and risks. So coming to your specific question, it is about how do you do that within a big organization like an ESCOM? And it is firstly acknowledging that risk lies with those areas and those functions and those persons that are accountable for, for actually implementing the controls and uh, the treatment of those risks. They've got to take accountability. But from a corporate point of view, it is essential that when from a corporate side and you're developing strategy and you're looking at the, 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 the material ESG issues, you're looking at the risk, that you've got to get that alignment and integration. And I think the, the, the boards of committees, the board of ESCOM well appreciate that, that you cannot do these things in isolation. When we're developing strategy, that strategy development has to take into account your ESG issues, your research requirements, your, um, your sustainability issues. And therefore, from, from a structural point of view, you've also got to ensure that there is that alignment working together to achieve it. You, you, you cannot have research doing their research on the sideline and strategy developing a strategy on the other side. Strategy must be, must be influenced by what research is telling you. Research should be directed what's coming out of the, the, the strategy, what the risks have been identified. And so that integration or alignment or synergies between risk, research, sustainability um, absolutely has to take place. And, and that's clearly what, what we always are attempting to do in ESCOM so that you do not do these things in isolation. What we want to achieve from a sustainable development point of view has to be well articulated and integrated into our strategy. Our business plan, from a corporate business plan must reflect those, those ESG issues, what comes out of the strategy, the risks that have come through by developing their strategy. And therefore you need that alignment to take place. And that alignment isn't an add on, it's alignment as you develop these things together. And that needs yeah. good robust discussions between those functional areas. Yeah, thanks Wendy. Yeah, thanks Dave. I think you've raised some really important points there. In my experience, also, it's more efficient because I know when we started integrating it, we found, okay, so you're also doing business intelligence and tracking things, and so are we. So we could do it together, and then we don't have to have two separate departments or pay subscriptions to people for data and that kind of thing. You know, So I think from a productivity and efficiency point of view, it's also really critical. But Baba, what is, uh, Baba, what is uh, innovation's role in all of this? Um, innovation's role is, I would say, it's vital. Um, there's this kind of saying, um, I think it's kind of like a popular saying about beginning with the end in mind. So I think if you can identify what your ultimate goal is, whether that's an internal goal, or as we've mentioned earlier, there's now externally um, imposed goals as well, pick what that goal is. And then while you're strategizing, try and figure out what's stopping you getting there. What are the obstacles? What are the blocks? You know, what are the issues in your supply chain or your value chain? And then basically that shows you what you need to improve. Either it's it's um, improving something 
or it's taking something completely new. I know not everything can be solved immediately, but then if you understand what the problems are, you can start to kind of play around with what could be potential solutions. So uh, Innovate UK on, on my particular project, Global Alliance Africa, we have various interventions that we run um, across Africa, but the key one that I, I work on is open innovation. And that's exactly what we do. We go to companies, we find out, you know, what would you like to do? What is your biggest headache? What's holding you back? Identify what that problem is, launch it as an international challenge. People apply with their solutions. And then that's, I guess that's the beauty that um, as well as getting the kind of expected solutions, you get unexpected solutions from different countries, different technologies, different industries even. I mean, one of our, I guess, most successful projects uh, in, in the last couple of years has been working with Rand Water, who I'm sure certainly the South Africans will be familiar with. Um, and uh, they have a, a problem with, obviously, they they um, process millions or possibly billions of tons of, uh, of water every day, and they get uh, waste streams, hundreds of tons of, of waste they don't know what to do with. So we actually help them to find a, a kind of a cross-sectoral solution from a, a domestic scale solution that can be scaled up and transformed into a, a, a huge industrial scale solution for them. So that's currently being piloted. Um, so I think that that's really what the key is to basically find out what the issue is. And as I said, it, whether that's internally or externally imposed, and then uh, start to work on a solution because there will always be solutions out there. It's more just a, a matter of what the time scale is. And then that's just going back to what I mentioned earlier as well. You have to really make sure that you apply resources because, you know, if you just identify the problem and leave the problem sitting, it's going to be a problem in five, 10 years time as well. But then you have to start at least prioritizing uh, some of your some of your team, some of your budget, some of your technological time towards working on that particular problem. That's the most pressing problem for you. And that's how you reduce risk and especially critical risks as well, because you need to start working on them in incremental ways. Sometimes they can be in, you know, a, a sudden uh, you know, complete holistic solution, but often it's an incremental thing that you kind of break it up into like bite-sized chunks and then work on it slowly. And as you do that and make progress, the amount of risk inherent will reduce over time. Thank you. Ahmed, do you want to just comment a little bit about how you can use co-creation and open innovation systems? Um, I think Sudesh was talking earlier about different stakeholders. Um, how do we leverage that in a positive way? Yeah, well, you, you just mentioned a moment ago about the benefits of collaboration. I mean, that's exactly what it is, that basically you engage with people who are outside of your networks, outside of your um, current supply chains, value chains, and um, you engage with them and you sort of then scope out projects together and um, and work on those projects and then get a positive outcome. And then, I mean, in our program, we're not the only people that run, obviously, open innovation programs. It's a well-established methodology, but we do have a particularly simple, accessible system because we're aware that a lot of people, they don't have huge amounts of time to spend on making uh, you know, lengthy applications that are 20 pages of text. So we make it a very simple process. So I think accessibility is very important as well. We make it easy for, for our partners, i.e. the people with the problems, and we make it easy for the people with the, um, uh, the solutions to actually come on board and collaborate actively with these partners. I mean, otherwise, how easy would it be for a little Rwandan startup to, for example, uh, have a live project with Unilever? or a little kind of husband and wife team with a bright idea to start working with Flamingo Horticulture, you know, who are um, sort of global producers and exporters of fresh produce. So I think you have to provide channels. So, I mean, I guess you need, you need the kind of people with the problems, you need the people with the solutions, and then you need people in between. And they can be internal. Uh, you can have teams doing that, or they can be external experts like ourselves, who, who basically are uh, the UK's um, government funded innovation agency and our job is to build these collaborations so people can basically extend their reach and get superpowers that they wouldn't have otherwise by themselves. Thank you and you mentioned SMMEs which is obviously really important for Africa as the majority of our economies in Africa are um, driven by SMMEs um, but they would some of them if you speak to them say that ESG in of itself is a risk to them because it's all this extra requirements that they is coming down the value chain with double materiality issues coming to the fore and now they have to to produce in this area um, which is an additional burden on them 
anyone on the panel got any comments on that? How we sort of help this risk and ESG drive um, with SMMEs? So Desh. Yeah, let me let me take a stab at that. So in, in a recent study that I've just conducted amongst South African corporates, uh, I did speak to some SMMEs as well. And the message is clear, exactly as you say, Wendy, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to keep the lights on. I'm focused on keeping my business sustainable and operational. I don't have time for all of these fancy requirements of yours. Okay. But, and, and that's where I think supplier development amongst the large companies becomes very important. The collaboration that uh, Baba was speaking about, the innovation that he also spoke about, I think it becomes very critical because if we look at the, as we move into scope one, as we move into the focus on scope three emissions, they part of the value chain and they will certainly have to start playing a bigger role and be more conscious of it. So if we're talking risk and organizational risk, if they're looking at their scope three emissions and the impact of the supply chain on their operations, they have to start focusing on supply development, especially the SMMEs who are the, the foundation and the building blocks of many of these large verticals that we see. So, I mean, sadly, SMMEs cannot do it on their own and they do need the support of large corporates and the supplier development program in the large corporates to help them develop the infrastructure, develop the capabilities and support them in the longer run. Anyone else on the panel want to talk to that? Dave, have you got any experience from an ESCOM perspective on, you know, pushing some of these requirements down onto SMMEs? Well, I, well, I think what Sudesh was saying, it is part of your supply development side. So from an ESCOM point of view, um, we have many suppliers and many of them small companies. And therefore, it's important as part of the processes that we got in place for supplier development to assist them in terms of meeting those requirements and making sure that they, they, they form part of that contractual um, agreement that you've got with suppliers. But, but I think it's also about making sure that these issues of ESG, double materiality and all of that is, is, is sort of broken down into the simple part of what does it mean? What does it mean to have uh, these risks what does it mean to have to deal with um, social issues? And what does it relate in terms of that product or that service that you're providing us? And how does it have to be dealt with? What is the expectation? But it is about breaking it down so it becomes more tangible um, and not at a, at a high level so that people say, oh, this is vague. This is something strategic. This is about big corporate. How do we break it down? How do we talk about it in terms of the context of a small business and the, and the implications for them in terms of environmental, social, and governance issues. Yeah. Thank you. Add, add um, yes, yes, of course. Yeah, we onboard obviously a lot of a lot of kind of small businesses as the as the winners of our challenges. And I think it's important to have we, we do a very kind of careful due diligence program as well to make sure that they fit the various requirements in terms of ESG and sort of financial credibility. So I think it is really important though to, as, as um, Dave's mentioning, to train them. So we offer them pitch training, for example, so they kind of really know what they're doing. We also have a certain degree of flexibility because not everyone is in the same place. So I think it's okay to have a little bit of flexibility. I'm not saying break the rules, but you can accommodate people as best you can. And don't just, you know, because they haven't ticked a certain box, they're suddenly no longer eligible as, as, a, as a partner or a collaborator. So I think it's just important to retain a bit of flexibility in the process, um, but all obviously working towards the same goal. Thank you. Patil, anything from your side? Yes, um, I do agree with uh, SMS, uh, SMMEs uh, are part of the supply chain. So at some point in time, they do have to meet the requirements of sustainability reporting or their performance being taken into account. Uh, and capacity building will play a huge role in that as well. Uh, one of the key drivers that will also enable these SMEs to better integrate, um, assess, um, sustainability and ESG is 
um, showcasing how um, sustainability and now will provide them access to capital. We do have the financial institutions that are integrating sustainability, ESG climate into their uh, decision making, whether that's lending or investing. So it's also uh, for their own benefit to let's say secure financing at lower interest rates or to, to, to secure capital in one way or another to also meet the requirements that uh, those um, uh, stakeholders, the financial institution stakeholders uh, the, that they have. Thank you. That's a really important point as well, I think, is that it's um it's bi-directional risk, right? It's coming from all kinds of different areas on the SMMEs. Um, while I've got you, I wanted to then ask a follow-up question on sort of while we're talking about the burdensomeness of the reporting, there are also emerging issues, right? So we've now got nature-based reporting like TCFD. Now we're going to the next level. What is uh what are some of the risks and opportunities and processes we're gonna have to do to incorporate that? Uh, one of the first things to um, acknowledge is that climate and nature are inseparable. And we have more studies where investors, companies, all types of stakeholders recognizing that biodiversity, natural capital, and ecosystem dependencies are inseparable uh, from a robust climate strategy. We do also have research from SMP Global Sustainable One that shows that 85% of the SMP, uh, SMP Global 1200 constituents, so we have the world largest companies, have at least uh, one of their assets and significant dependencies across their direct operations um, uh, impacting and depending on uh, the natural eco ecosystems. So it's very important to measure and protect uh, natural resources that companies and communities rely on. Uh, nature is more than a climate. So climate is short for climate change related transition and physical risk opportunities. Whereas nature is, is, is a broader concept. It includes land, ocean, freshwater, and atmosphere. As for the TNF that you, you mentioned, the task force for nature related uh, financial disclosures. And climate is affecting each one of those realms. So we have uh, climate affecting the ocean, climate affecting uh, the land. Uh, so it's uh, and uh, uh, so it nature includes other topics beyond uh, greenhouse gas emissions like um, pollution. So all of these topics should be integrated, uh, nature and uh, climate change into uh, the supply chain, the, source, the sourcing of, of, uh, of materials. And I think with the right frameworks in place like the TCFD, uh, that's giving the right guidance, uh, companies will have more clarity on what are the key metrics uh, and what are the ways to go beyond climate and integrate nature into their uh, risk and uh, risk uh, strategies and overall business strategies. Thank you. I mean, I think it, it points again to the fact that business is now having to deal with a lot of global issues, which wouldn't necessarily impact them before, but now have come through mostly from funders to um, into their decision making. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna go to a question because I see we have one in the group, uh, in the chat from uh, Tabi Ling. She asks, beyond ESG integration, is there is reporting and disclosure? I just argued that the ESD 2.0, so that's the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the CSDDD, the SEC climate disclosures, et cetera, in the United States will become more will become burdensome as we've just been discussing. But she's asking, are we likely to see the fatigue and loss of momentum on ESG in the next couple of years added to that ESG backlash as we've seen in the EU and US? Anybody want to comment on that one, Sudesh? Yeah, I'll have a go. Uh, it's a yes and no answer. And um... There, there's a term that I use called ESG usual. I mean, I, I believe that we're in a transition phase now where ESG is becoming part of business as usual. So, I mean, as it stands in the next three to five years, we might not have be having such a detailed discussion about ESG risks and things like that because it's 
seamlessly integrated into business operations. Okay. In terms of, um, sorry, where was I? Just lost my train of thought. But yeah, so really that, that's what it comes down to. We're in a transition phase now. So ESG, uh, we will we will see more of it built in and integrated into business processes and not as a standalone that we see now. Okay, so you're saying that um, fading out could be not that it's fading away, but that it's integrated and now it just has become business as usual. Um, Absolutely. At some Absolutely. level, yeah. Yeah, and I can okay. give you an example. Else? Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, carry on. I was going to say, I'll give you a real example. In South Africa, if we look at, uh, you know, what are the concerns around business continuity, around business sustainability? I mean, one of the big things we've experienced is load shedding. And a number of companies have had to really focus on uh, security of energy supply. And what did they do? They went and installed solar. I mean, and, and solar, large capacity of solar just to ensure that their operations uh, continued, you know, continuity of their operations. So is it an ESG initiative or is it a business as usual continuity initiative? And we've seen a number of those instances. I mean, if you look at the mines, they talk about water security. It's a similar, similar case with water security. Multiple industries have implemented solar from a, from a, uh, from a energy supply. If we look at the mining industry, when it came to COVID, for example, uh, there's a very big mine, one of the South African mines. They said that, you know what, we are not going to test only our employees. We are going to extend the testing to the communities that they come from. And in doing so, they uh, they, they managed almost 100% uptime in terms of their operations. And there was no break in their operations because of uh, resource constraints and human resource constraints because of illnesses, COVID illnesses. So it was that kind of thing. You know, where it's a business as usual imperative as opposed to an ESG uh, imperative. Yeah, I think I've just recently done some work in the food and beverage manufacturing sector, and a lot of them said that, but a lot of them also said we're getting pressures from our customers to mm. um, reduce our CO2 emissions. So if we had a choice between a solar panel and storage and a generator that's diesel driven, we chose the solar panels because of, we could see this future risk around the carbon intensity of our exports into the EU or something like that, you know. So it's very complex, as you say, right? Anybody mm -hmm. else want to talk on that comment? Patil? Yes. So this question actually uh, takes me back to something I said earlier, which is uh, selecting the, the, the framework that is uh, sector specific that aligns with the uh, requirement, whether that it's regulatory requirement or stakeholder in, uh, requirement. So there are many frameworks, some of them are specific to financial institutions, some of them are specific for um, investors. So uh, first step is to always identify uh, the framework that is relevant for your sector, for your industry, uh, for, 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 for your regulator. And then we, yes, there are many frameworks out there and it's, it, it keeps, uh, keeps on evolving, but there are similarities that we're seeing across these frameworks. So these frameworks always have the focus on, on materiality. Uh, the, the, what they, they always advocate to, to identify what is financially material. Uh, um, they, they're also in line with international standards. So we do see that, for example, the CSRD or the other frameworks are in line with the GRI or the TCFD. So we're seeing those different frameworks, the baseline, the foundation of these different reporting requirements are more or less the same, which is um, reporting as per the different uh, frameworks, which is the, the, the GRI, having the scenario analysis concept in mind, which is aligning with the TCFD or the ISSB. There are, of course, different uh, uh, differences, such as uh, the scope of disclosure could be different uh, depending, uh, depending on the regulation, depending um, on the framework. But I think overall, all the frameworks out there uh, have the objective of having enhanced uh, transparency, guiding the companies on what to disclose, how to disclose, um, educating them on what is 
materiality, double materiality, financial materiality. And then it's up to the company to select the right framework, taking into account all the external and internal um, drivers and selecting the one that will create the most value to them as a company. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on this particular issue? Dave? Uh, yeah, maybe, Wendy. I, I, I sort of, a, although people may say ESG may be a, a little bit of what's popular at the moment and maybe there'll be fatigue and maybe it will phase out, I, I do think it is based on, again, those material issues within the context in which one operates. And, the, and, and that's what makes a business successful or not. Are you addressing what are those material risks to yourself and to society in which you operate? And are you demonstrating that you are managing those risks and also pursuing those opportunities? I also agree what Patel was saying that there are many standards out there but there is this alignment. They all talk about the same things. And I think there is a, there's a good alignment between what the standards are talking about in terms of, of sustainability reporting or ESG reporting. There, 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 there is a, a common alignment between them. And it just helps organizations in terms of how to structure things, how to make sure that the information you do disclose to the public it, it is recognizable and people can use it. But I do think ultimately it is about the sustainability of an organization. It is about have you identified what are those material um, issues facing you from a sustainability point of view? Yes, and they clearly often are environmental, social and governance issues as you do with technology, um, about finance risks. And it is about how you're treating that and how you're pursuing those opportunities. And so ESG may seem like a little bit of a flavor, but it is something that we have always been aware of and pursuing from a sustainability point of view. And it's just making sure that we are consciously always looking to say, have we really identified all the material issues? Are there new emerging material issues that are impacting on society or impacting the environment that we haven't identified, but our stakeholders are telling us about, and that we are making that part of our strategies, making it part of that risk processes that we have. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, Baba? Yeah, just, just to, br to briefly add to what my um, uh, fellow panelists have said, you know, Dave and Sudesh, I agree, business as usual is always changing. There's always going to be, you know, kind of uh, further expectations in terms of doing a better job. And um, what that leads to, it will be the next set of challenges to be solved. And as Patil said, it's up to you then to identify what are the key drivers, you know, what are these next set of challenges now that the parameters of business as usual and uh, expectations have changed. And then that would be the focus of your innovation efforts, basically, to then focus on whatever's coming next. Thank you. So I think my response, if I can sum up what a lot of you, what you have said, is that ESG, if you look at it from a risk perspective, positive and negative, is something that you would do because it makes business sense. Not just you're not just doing the right thing. You're doing it. You have to. You make the business case for doing it. And um, I wanted to ask about you know the competitive edge that that gives. If you ignore that stakeholders are going to or the social aspect. Um, and I see these comments in the chat about, um, you know, we know that's happened in the US with some states saying you shouldn't include social issues into um, financial decision making. But if you ignore it, there's this huge risk that you're going to have people toy toying or protesting outside your plant, not buying your products, whatever else it is. So it's definitely a competitive advantage at the end of the day. So how do we make it instead of being seen as this add-on um, still, even if you have it into risk and strategy, as just this is the way we should be doing business because it makes business sense. So Desh, do you want to comment? Yeah, look, the, the fundamental thing is that ESG is not, you mentioned it, uh, Wendy, ESG is not a compliance issue. It is a do what is right and do what is right for the business. So if you look at it in, from that perspective, it certainly is a competitive advantage. If you innovate better than your, your peers, you, 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 you take a leap ahead in the market. If you are able to um, 
introduce policies that can attract and retain top talent, you win the war on talent in the market. So it is certainly a competitive advantage. And I mean, there's a big retailer, food retailer in the country that, that their business model is built on, on the whole green. I mean, we all know it. I'm not going to mention the name. Okay. Their business model is, is built on having a green, um, a green focus. The fact that they use uh, sustainable packaging, re, uh, recycled packaging, customers uh, are attracted to that kind of ethical stance that the organization has taken. And I mean, they're still, they're still surviving comfortably today. So, I mean, there's, those are just three examples, but there are multiple similar examples in the country where ESG is a competitive advantage. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, I won't go on with more yeah. examples. <laughs> Thank you. And you raise a really important point there also about that it's, and I think Dave also spoke about it, that everybody in the company has to implement ESG. Yeah. And that, so they have to understand the risks of not doing and doing and what it means for them. So is there a risk that we are not creating enough awareness in our companies about the business case for ESG, that they still potentially see it as an add-on? But Teal, have you seen anything with your global work around what's best practice with companies around raising awareness around this so that it doesn't have to just be the sustainabilities department or the strategy department's problem? Patil, you on mute? You on mute? So I, I did have some technical issues. Can you hear me? Oh, no problem. Yes, we can hear you. Please carry on. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, just can you repeat the question? I did have some technical issues, Wendy. So I was just asking about, have you seen best practice around raising awareness of ESG and how um, the business case for doing it so that people will see opportunities and risks in what they're doing? across yes. the organization across the organization so i think education is very important across the organization bringing together the different business lines business lines business different uh, departments and to show how esg and uh the different uh KPIs and metrics uh how first of all it's relevant to day day to day work and how in their turn, they can create value uh, for the organization. So I think uh, internal education for the different teams is very important. Uh, the second is relying on uh, credible data, whether you want to talk um, on topics such as risk management or climate strategy, emissions, social, always have robust data that is built on uh, relevant methodologies. Uh, uh, the data is really the foundation. It's, 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 it's fundamental. Uh, so always ensure that uh, when you're speaking to those different uh, key people within the organization, you have the data that translates sustainability to what they work as a company to 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 drive um, value. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's what I've seen um, in in my region, which is Middle East and Africa, and globally as a best practice adopted. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel want to comment on that? Sudesh. Yeah, I mean, I I'm going to give Dave and Baba a chance. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, I mean, there, there certainly needs to be awareness created in the organization and it's easy to build up a business case, but if there isn't buy-in at all levels, I mean, the business case is dead in the water. And I mean, again, from the studies that I've just conducted, I found that leadership is absolutely critical and they, they're probably the biggest risk in this whole process. They are absolutely critical to, to create the ambition for the organization, to create the drive, to create the will. And in most of the large corporates in South Africa, the ESG initiative is led by the CEO or someone at that senior level, just to drive it through the organization because you need that tone from the top, you need the message from the top, you need the will from the top. And, and that's what's happening. 
And equally, the opposite of that is if there isn't that leadership will to execute anything within the organization, you can have the best business case, the best training programs, it goes nowhere. Baba, you wanted to say, Ed? Yeah, I was, I was just going to add, you know, obviously there's the internal side and the external side is, is super important as well as we've kind of briefly touched on. I mean, my initial career was in marketing and then I moved more towards sustainability and innovation. And I sort of forgot about marketing, but now I've rediscovered how important it is because you can make all the changes uh, you want. But unless um, you communi communicate those in a skillful and convincing way, both internally and externally, people's behavior won't change. People's attitudes won't change. So that's super, really super important as well. Um, and then that that's if you understand your audience, then you can sort of supply them with with um, various offers and benefits that would suit them. And that creates to not only kind of consumer satisfaction, but long-term financial viability and sustainability of your organization. Um, it has to be a, a very sort of carefully communicated uh, process that convinces people because it, back in Unilever, they used to, I don't know if they still use it, a, a kind of a term called emo funk, which is, you know, whenever you're looking at any proposal, look at the emotional side and the functional side. The functional side is is kind of reasonably obvious, you know, in the sense it has to make money, it has to deliver the benefits that people are buying it for. But the emotional side as well, of course, you know, the kind of things we've just mentioned, people have to feel good about it, people have to be willing to go out of their way for your particular product or service, even, even just to sort of change their habits, like I buy the same tea. I have been for 30 years, but, you know, so it takes something important for me to to look up and go, oh, actually, I'm going to look at that other brand now or that other business because they're doing something good. Um, so I think, yeah, the emotional side and the functional side together are the way to kind of genuinely kind of move people to think of things in a different way. I love that. I'm going to use it. We're having a session at the conference in October on purpose driven communication and marketing. Um, and how if it's not authentic, people pick up on it and they will pretty soon um, see through you and <laughs> if you're not transparent. So thank you for raising that. That's a great, great comment. Um, I want to just, there's a couple of comments in the chat here that I want to just raise with the panel before we close. So um, there is a comment about consolidating reporting from Tabiling, totally agree. Um, there's a question about qualifications, which I think we can chat outside about this and also come to the conference. We've got one on a session on ESG skills. Um, and then there's a comment from Folkma on companies, local or international, what, which ones have made specific, implemented specific ESG trends with broader demographic benefits? that may set themselves apart from any ESG copycats? Or are we entering a new label of data accumulation and ESG whitewashing efforts? Anyone on the panel want to take that one? So, so, so Wendy, let me have a, a go at, at those questions. I, 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 think, I think firstly, from a, from a reporting point of view, and I think what we started off with the discussion is that, that ESG has to be part of your process of developing strategy, the way that you look at risk, which ultimately means that you are going to set up programs, you're going to have initiatives to achieve those objectives that you've developed through your strategy. You are going to be developing how you're going to treat those risks that you've identified. You're going to be looking at those plans to pursue those opportunities that you've identified which means that you're going to set key performance indicators that are aligned to that, which means you're going to report against those key performance indicators. And as long as ESG is part of your strategy development, it's part of your risk processes, it then becomes an integral part of what are those objectives that you want to achieve within your business. Therefore, it's what you're going to be reporting on as key performance areas that you want to achieve. If it's standalone and separate, then it means nothing. It's got to be a whole integrated approach to it. And, and I think that's really what becomes the, the critical message, that, that, that it's not about something separate ESG. It's not about something that you're doing to please people. You're doing it because it is a 
material risk that you've identified through your stakeholders, through your customers, through the, the regional context in which you're operating. And therefore you're making sure it is an integral part of your overall strategy risk, your programs are put in place and you're reporting um, against key performance areas as well. Thank Thanks. you, Dave. Um, anyone want to comment on the greenwashing risks or other kinds of washing that we have these days? Pink, blue, white. <laughs> No, I think it's a huge risk uh, for, and so I'm glad it was raised in the chat. Um, I think it's what Dave says, if you're transparent and you report on material issues and you do what you say you're going to do, um, then it shouldn't be an issue. But yes, there's been a lot of cases around greenwashing um, and pinkwashing and whitewashing and blue washing people saying that they were members of the global compact and they weren't and things like that so that is a huge risk if you don't you're not transparent so we've come to three o'clock and i see there are no more questions in the um in the box i'm going to ask each panelist just to make just a minute on closing comments what is your i think dave you've already made your takeaway comment on the integration, um, which I think is a really good one. Do you have anything else to add? I, th I think also just, um, Wendy, the, the, the issue around innovation, I know we touched on it a, a bit earlier on. And, and I think that the good old saying by old Peter Trucken, culture eats strategy for breakfast. When one looks at ESG, when one looks at risk, when one looks at strategy, and pulling these together, it requires an innovative approach. And that innovative approach isn't something that is part of your strategy. It's part of the culture. And it's a part of the way you get people to look at and, and the way that they pitch up at work. And so it's very important. So like in Eskom, we talk about the Eskom way. It talks about zero harm um, innovation, as well as other values. But that value of innovation means that the way that we approach risk, the way that you approach your strategy, the way that you approach ESG means you've got to be innovative. It means you've got to have robust discussions. It means you've got to question. It means you've got to be asking the right questions. It means you've got to bring in many different minds to be able to find innovative solutions of how to address risk, how to address those material ESG issues. It's about stimulating innovative thinking as to how you're going to pursue those opportunities that lie in terms of ESG. But again, it's, it's around culture of the company to do that. You cannot say, we'll be innovative and just put it in your strategy. You've got to create that, that culture within the organization that then brings that together in the way that you pursue those material ESG matters um, in the business. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sudesh, you want to comment? Uh, closing comments from my side. Look, uh, ESG, I'm going to speak a bit more broadly about ESG. It's certainly a competitive advantage. The ESG is, and I'm looking at it across environmental, social, and governance. We've got to look at this holistically. And there's a whole ecosystem and a value chain that exists from a strategic uh, part within an organization to the operational part. And there are risks at every level of this. So again, when identifying these risks, they've got to be um, sort of uh, teed off against the organizational risk and assessed within the entire organizational risk framework. So ESG is certainly a competitive advantage. It is certainly uh, from the research. It is certainly it certainly contributes long-term value creation. And I mean, organizations that are not uh, focusing on ESG within their um, their strategy are being left behind in the greater scheme of things. Baba, closing uh, comments from you. Sure, I think I've probably covered most of them already, but I guess just in summary, um, I'd say begin with the end in mind. So kind of think, you know, what it is you want to achieve as an organization that ties into the various comments about culture and, and kind of mindset. 
and then identify what the key challenges are that you need to resolve and and um, and kind of find the key drivers, uh, whether that be through innovation processes or, or other kind of processes that suit your industry. Um, and then what if you do manage to make progress and solve your issues in the ESG space and other spaces as well, you'll find, I guess, um, the, the risks are reduced because you will have a longer term kind of resilience to your business. And the opportunities are increased because you'll be, find ways of um, generating value, whether through circular you know, thinking or, or otherwise. And you'll also have a lot of collaborators in place as well, where you can work together on kind of broader um, kind of industry solutions as well as solutions to your specific industry. So I think it's just about um, the yeah, collaboration, innovation, and obviously the many insights that my fellow panelists have mentioned. Great, thank you so much. Uh, before I hand back to Shannon, um, I just also wanted to let you know that please, as we said, the conference is on 1st and 2nd of October. Our next um, webinar is gonna be on another issue that's very closely linked to what we've just been talking about and what Dave was saying about culture eating strategy for breakfast. And that is systemic change as a really important tool for driving ESG. So we've got some really great panelists lined up for that, and I hope you will be able to join us. But thank you so much to my panelists. And Shannon, I will hand back to you. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure sharing the topic of integrated ESG into strategic and organizational risk processes. Before we wrap up, I'd like to extend my gratitude to our moderator, Wendy Poulton, and guest speakers, Baba Javed from Innovate UK Global Alliance Africa, Sudesh Prasad from Blue Semper Consulting, David Lucas from ESCOM, and Patil Mizrobian from SP Global Sustainable One. They've all contributed in making this webinar a success. If you have any further questions or would like to continue the conversation, feel free to reach out to us via email at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. If you're interested in hearing more about the ESG Africa conference, please visit the website at www.esgafricaconference.com. And lastly, we value your feedback. So please take a moment to fill out the poll that's on your screen now. The next ESG Africa conference webinar takes place on the 12th of September, 2024 at 4 p.m. As Wendy mentioned, the link to register has been shared in the chat. So with that, I'd like to bid you all farewell. Thank you so much for your time and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.